You're listening to Barbell Logic, the podcast where we talk about what it means to experience strength and how you can use simple, hard, and effective strategies in training and nutrition to improve your life. It starts with meeting you where you are right now and finding lasting solutions. Welcome to the show. You're listening to the Barbell Logic podcast. I'm your host, Matt Reynolds. This is a coaching success series, and I'm here with Mitchell Baldridge, a good friend of mine. We actually got to finally meet over the podcast. Welcome, Mitchell, to the show today. Thanks for having me. I'm a longtime listener and user of the product. I'm a big fan of your podcast with Scott Hambrick, Stupid Tax, that you guys have been doing for, gosh, probably, what, three, four, five months now. Yeah, yeah. Which I have promoted on this show. You don't pay me to promote it, but I think it's a very synergistic podcast with what we do here. You guys talk a lot about business ownership. I love the stories that you tell often of a, you know, a guy that owns a power washing business and love some of the anecdotes and principles that you talk about that business owners, you really believe that any business owner could make $400,000 a year. For a lot of people that probably makes their eyes kind of bug out of their head. Like, how is that even possible? But you give both great kind of 30,000 foot view values on how to do that. And then you dive into the trenches and talk practically about how to do that on the Stupid Tax podcast. And likewise, you don't pay me to say that. I don't pay you guys to talk about us, but it, I think it's been a very good uh, synergistic relationship. And so I'm excited to have you on as a CPA. So you are a CPA, you're based in Houston, you own Baldridge Financial, as well as you have a software company really called Better Bookkeeping, yep. a bookkeeping software service maybe not an exact one-to-one competitor with like QuickBooks Online, but you've got a way to do bookkeeping. And it's, from what I understand, very clean and frictionless, and it helps people who aren't used to doing that sort of thing. And then you offer a companion service with that. So why don't we start before we dive into the meat of the podcast, just give us a little bit of your background, talk a little bit about the businesses that you own, and I guess why that gives you some level of authority and expertise in this world. And then we'll dive into probably some of the questions that our listeners are going to have for, uh, I think it gets scary when it comes time to start hiring, you know, people like CPAs and attorneys and good insurance and stuff like that. So I would love to just dive into some of that on where these young up and coming business owners start and how they find a good CPA and things like that. But let's start with a little bit of background on who you are and what you do. Sure. Yeah. So I'm Mitchell Baldridge from Houston, Texas. Went to school for accounting, got out of school, worked for a few accounting firms, served my time and got out of there as quick as I could and started my own business about 10 years ago now. And it was kind of me and a card table. And then I got a contractor and then I got another contractor, hired an employee and we scaled up, you know, to a nice size firm in Houston. And then starting in 2020, I started, you know, plan on the internet and have seen a huge kind of growth in people who have kind of listened to what I had to say and of course scaled my business accordingly. So it's been a wild ride. Aside from being a CPA, I'm a financial planner. You know, like I'm not your CPA or your financial planner, so not tax advice. (laughs) But one other thing I just want to say, like I've become good friends with Scott Hambrick, former co-host of the show. Yeah, original co-host of the show. Met Scott Hamrick listening to you, him, and uh, that crazy episode way back in the day with Diamond Dave Kiesling, where y'all were yep. <laughs> talking through it. Our attorney. Yep. I immediately just sent him an email and was like, Scott, we got to get on a phone call. Like, what is happening? Who is this guy? What are y'all doing? I love it. This is it. My favorite part of that story, for those that don't know, so Kiesling is our legal attorney. Of course, at this point, the size of our business, we have all sorts of attorneys for different things. Yeah. You know, we've got tax attorneys and we've got HR attorneys and all that stuff. But Kiesling is, he's a shark. He wants to be in the courtroom having arguments, the kind of stuff that's terrifying to everyone else. And the funny story about that is that Scott was in a lawsuit and Kiesling was the attorney of the person that was suing Scott. And Scott's story is that Kiesling went in and kicked the shit out of him. (laughs) Bailed him to the wall. Yep. That's right. And I think it was about a year later, Scott called him and said, hey, could we break down what happened there? And Kiesling said, uh, do you have any other attorneys retained right now? He said, no. He said, let me call you back. And so you know, they did the thing that attorneys always do and did the background check and make sure there wasn't any, uh, any things that would make it so they couldn't speak. And then Kiesling called him and said, here's why I kicked your ass. <laughs> so immediately after that call, Hambrick hired Kiesling to be his attorney. <laughs> and uh, 
course, later, it was great to have that same contact. And uh, certainly, Kiesling has helped us through a pretty big lawsuit in 2019. And so, uh, yeah, it's crazy how that network of the world sort of works. There's an episode of Stupid Tax. Listen to the Kiesling episode on Barbell Logic from five years ago and then listen to them on Stupid Tax. But there's a lesson of coachability in there with Scott, certainly, and just a lesson of like the power of deep expertise and just dealing with a wild animal and knowing <laughs> knowing that how the right person can do the right job for you in your business. Exactly right. How big is your staff now for your team, at least for the CPA firm? I think for better bookkeeping, we're at probably nine or 10 all in. We have small businesses over here and probably for the CPA firm now, we're at like somewhere 15, 16, 18. And then we do this thing called cost segregation services. It's an engineering service for real estate investors. And that thing's probably at like 35. So we're at 50 some odd employees in these companies. That's great. So one of the things that I think I'll just piggyback off of talking about Scott and Kiesling and one of the things I've thought about, and I've mentioned this on the podcast before, is that in any industry, there is a very small group of people that really know they are the true experts. And I think for us, finding that group of people in whatever industry you are seeking is paramount. And so, you know, finding the best attorneys for the job for you, the best CPAs, the best insurance, that, you know, the best doctor, the best general practitioner, the best strength coach, whatever that is. And for those of us that are in that field, and I don't mean that in an arrogant sort of way, but like once you've sort of figured out who those people are, that's a pretty small network in each of those industries. And you kind of realize that most everyone else in the industry is sort of LARPing there. And so I think one of the things that I've thought about for many years are what are the industries that I hire people for, you know, I don't know, HVAC or dentistry or whatever that how do I find the true experts in the field? And so, you know, I don't know if you've got a general principle that you use there, but then I would like to dive into as business owners, as especially with this podcast, we've got a lot of young and up and coming business owners. And I know you guys have talked about on Stupid Tax, the most important thing first early on is just to get your first paying customer before you really have to figure out all the rest of the stuff. And even potentially before you set up LLCs and hire CPAs and all that sort of stuff, the key is to find a customer that pays. And especially this time of year, it's early in the year. We're recording this at the end of January. This will come out in early February. This is a great time of year to just start to find paying customers. But then as you start to work down to grow the business, I guess my first question is, what can these young business owners do? And what are some of the first steps they need to do to set themselves up well for proper bookkeeping, for proper you know, P&Ls and starting to do that thing? And then when it comes time to look for a CPA, one, when do they know it's time to find a CPA and how do they find a good one to help them do what they do? Like a great frame to set this whole thing in is, yeah, you're listening to this because you're a strength coach and you're growing your small business and bootstrapping your own business. And you're a technical expert. You're out in the market and you're trying to sell this technical expertise to a number of different clients in a number of different ways with the goal that everyone's trying to get stronger. So like the same way you would evaluate your services versus other people who do what you do. This is the kind of frame you go into hiring other professionals. What I would do to go hire you. The number one goal is find revenue. Like go find your first customer. Don't get business cards. Don't get a logo. Don't get a name. Don't get a, a like if you wake up in the middle of the night and a name comes into your head, write it down and then keep going to get a customer. Because like I had an early client who was a psychotherapist and she was trying to leave her job and start her own practice. And she was just so, I love this woman, but she was so neurotic about the whole thing. And I was like, I'm not going to talk to you until you have eight customers, until you have eight people a week paying you 150 hours to sit and talk to you. Don't talk to me. Before you do that, though, set up a new bank account. I didn't even tell her to set up a business account. Talk to your lawyer before this. Sure. You know, set up a bank account, find a credit card out of your drawer that you're not using for anything else and get the Stripe account to point to that bank account 
and use that credit card only for business expenses. Yep. And you know, if it's January, whatever, 25th today, if all you do is do that until April or shoot, do that until July, you're probably in good shape. You're finding revenue. You're spending money that really at the smallest amount you need to spend. Sorry if you're selling business coaching, but you're not getting business coaching. That's right. You're not like worrying about anything. You're just going, hey, I'm a really, really damn good barbell coach. A lot of people want to get stronger. I'm going to go find five people who want to get stronger and I'm going to have them in my garage three times a week. And we're going to go get some people strong and we're going to collect a little bit of money. That's right. Some people get worried about, and I do this, I think so far into the future sometimes where it's like, but what about my business? What about my unit economics? And it's like, that crap all doesn't matter. Don't even make money at it. Charge them 50 bucks. You're trying to start the flywheel. You're throwing grist into the mill and you're just trying to get the whole thing going so that when you're ready to really get organized, there's something to organize, right? Yep, that's right. Yeah, I totally agree. This is one of the things with, you were talking about, you know, just get train some people in your garage. I would obviously say also you could do online coaching and make even more money anywhere in the world. And like get someone signing up, get someone That's somewhere right. to pay you to do something simple as possible. Look, in linear progression, you start with the bar and you go, well, I'm 245 pounds. <laughs> and it's like, well, you're going to add five pounds three times a week. And before you know it, it's going to be 500 pounds and you're going to fall over. So don't worry. And then things have to become a little more complicated. But in the beginning, you know, one of the taglines that Scott and I talked about for years since, you know, 2016, 2017 is simple, hard, effective, simple and hard are often the most effective things. And so, you know, I've got a buddy, I actually want to give him a shout out because he's a big fan of both this podcast and your podcast. And he is the guy that you talk about. He's got the pressure washing company. He's the handyman. He can kind of do anything this time of year. Most of what he does is outside is, you know, is and it's freezing cold. You know, we've had it's not freezing cold in Houston, but it's freezing cold in Springfield, Missouri. So I've walked him through like, what are the things that you can do indoors when it's freezing cold outside, when it's raining, when it's icy, when it's whatever. And so to get those paying clients. And so I've kind of helped walk him through both from my podcast and from your podcast, which he he listened to. The other nice thing about when you do that kind of manual labor sort of job, blue collar job, is that a lot of the work that he does, you know, if he's cleaning out gutters, he can listen to these podcasts while he's doing the work. You can't do that as a CPA. I can't do that when I'm online coaching or when I'm, you know, as a, doing CEO work. But for him, a lot of that work, he can really glean a ton of knowledge and wisdom and information. And so shout out to Eric, my good buddy, Eric, he actually laid new flooring for us yesterday in our laundry room, and he installed a new industrial sink. And so and the key there was we helped him set up a way for simple invoicing through Stripe. So at the end of the job yesterday afternoon, he went home, he sent me an email, we had already discussed the bid. He got the job done. He did an excellent job, say satisfactory, but it was more than that. He did a great job. There's an option to tip if you want to, if he did an, an excellent job. And I was able to pay easily with my credit card that was already on file that deposited directly to his account that he uses specifically for business. When you do that, because you are a, what the government will see is just a sole proprietor. You're just, you're the only owner, only employee, only anything. You can write yourself checks, draws, ownership draws out of that account. I know for me and, and for you, we would say for those of you who are working a normal day job, you do a day job that's something else from the business ownership that you're trying to build. I would highly recommend that you try to live off of the money off your day job and to try to store as much money as you can off of the new business that you're building. And I talked about this in the podcast last week. I don't know if you've seen this as well, but I don't have any published studies to back this up, but I have noticed that when you do that, when you take that sort of strategy where you are living off of your main gig and you're trying to build a business that you're passionate about, you're often working 70, 80, 90 hours a week. It's sort of second shift on the new business. And when it's your new business and it's new business ownership, you're really excited about it and there's a lot of pride and you can pull 80 hour, 90 hour, 100 hour weeks for a while. What I've seen is there's an over under, I think, of about 18 months, maybe give or take six months before you burn out, right? So there is a time clock there. You were talking about the lady that was the psychotherapist and she was trying to figure out how to leave her job and do this new thing. Like, hold on, 
do the job that you're currently doing as your day job. Start to make money and get customers in the new business that you own. And at some point, you'll be able to make the crossover where you'll actually get to leave the old job and just do the new job. But I think both of us would agree it would be stupid to leave the job that's paying you the 65 grand a year on a you know yearly basis that's safe and secure while you're trying to build the new job. You just have to know you've got to come home and work second shift for a while and do both jobs. The hard part that I've noticed is that when that main gig pays you, let's say again, you're making sixty, sixty-five thousand dollars a year, and the new job gets up to say forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, you're making a hundred and ten. It's real hard to leave the old job and go back to forty-five. That's why I think it's really important to not live off both of that income, but to only live off the main gigs income while you're building the new business so that it's easy to transition over to the new business when it's time to do it. If your lifestyle changes over a 12 month period from making 60 grand a year to 120 grand a year, it's going to be really hard to leave the main gig and go back to 60 grand a year. And you're going to run into the wall and kind of be out of options and burn out. That's right. And you're still going to have the boat loan. Yeah, I did. the Everything that you just said not to do, I did. I was young. I was married. We didn't have kids. My wife had a good job. I had a good job. And I went to her one day and said, hey, I'm going to leave my job. My rationale, I, dude, I was an accountant. And I was making, you know, whatever, like you're talking about, 70 grand a year. And I knew that if I failed, I could just go find a new job making 80 grand. And so, you know, the risk sometimes is overblown, but also the way, I mean, this lady who we just talked about, she's still in private practice for herself. And she had a job, I think with the county and she was, it was a government job and she started working nights and she filled in from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. every night seeing private clients. And then she was making as much three hours a day as she was making the other eight. And she pulled the ripcord and it worked, you know? That's great. So that the beginning, like you're saying, you get the Stripe account, you find a way that you can tap a credit card onto your phone and make money That's right. in a legal way. And then you get a separate bank account, whether it be a DBA or a business account or just another personal account. I don't care. We're proving a concept here. You get another credit card or you don't get a credit card. You just get a debit card, even better. And you start spending the money out of that same account. And now you have that whole business in one box. It's siloed. And if it's a closed system, like a bank account, meaning you can't spend more money than what you put into it, even better. Like you de-risked your whole thing. Yeah, it forces you to be profitable from day one. Yep. You have to be. Right. And that's the danger of the credit card. If you go get the big Amex, that platinum card that doesn't even have a a limit on it, which it would be tough to do probably on day one of business ownership, you really open yourself up to risk. Sure. Because you're like, well, if I spend, you know, $25,000 now, I'll make it up. Man, that's a, again, I am a big fan of trying to start a business with as little risk as possible. So make that money. If you're an HVAC guy or, and you're working for somebody else or you're, a teacher, a school teacher, and you're, you know, and again, you're not making a ton of money, but it's safe money, make that safe money and then work that second shift and build that business until you're in a position where you can leave, right? And so again, like you said, as a CPA, if you have a high level of skill in a very sought after industry, it's not difficult. If your business didn't work, you could go get a CPA job, you know, somewhere you're in Houston, especially like easy, right? To go get that. And that might be you. And so there's less risk. But if you've spent 18 years working your way up in a very niche sort of business, that's a lot more risky to jump ship and to start your own business. So I would say, do the best you can to start getting those clients, put that money in the bank, only spend that money out of that bank account on the business, right? Everything is siloed and you've put yourself in a really good position to then be able to start building out things six months later like P&Ls. And when it comes time to do your taxes at the end of the year, if you hire the CPA, you're not digging through, you know, a shoebox of receipts because everything is in that one account. It's not your kid's haircut and your trip and your, you know, your wife's nails. And then, yeah, all the, oh, and then I spent money to, you know, pay a contractor. So at the outset, I said this before, I'll say it again, like, do not overinvest in your business. Your investment in your business 
at the beginning has to be amortized over the life of the business. Meaning if you're going to go train clients and they're going to pay you $100 a session, if I spend $10,000 on logos and wrapping my truck and doing all this crap, yep. then I have to go do a thousand sessions to get that down to 10 bucks a session That's right. to normalize that cost. It's just so much easier to do that later and you'll know so much more about the market. I mean, I, I've told you about all the kind of like business stuff I'm doing. Yesterday, I was sitting in a meeting with two guys and we're talking about launching this new service line and we're all going, oh, we're going to go out and hire somebody to do it. And one of my partners literally goes, why don't we just not hire somebody? Why don't we just launch the service line and see what happens? And Mitchell, you bust your butt and do the work and service it. And we'll figure out in 90 days whether we want to get somebody to leave their job to come work. Yeah. Good idea. (laughs) So this goes forever. So yeah, it's really set up a foundational container to run the business in even before you have good advice. Don't overinvest on the outset. And then I mean, you go to who do I hire? How do I start hiring professionals? And it's tough to find a good CPA. It's probably tough to find a good barbell coach when you're starting out. Of course it is. It's tough to find a good lawyer. Matt Kiesling didn't want to work with you until you had hit the point where Scott told him to work with you and Scott told him to work with you because you were where you were at. So that's right. It's just like, it's not fair, but it's tough for the new guys to find the best help. Let's make the bridge here. So let's say you are this young upstart business owner. Maybe you're in the fitness industry. Most of you listening are you're coaching. Maybe you've got a, again, I would, some of the practical things in the fitness industry, I would say is don't go get a $5,000 a month lease to start a new gym, like start training people out of your garage gym if you can. Don't pay Rogue $50,000 immediately on credit. Right. Don't get a big loan for a bunch of equipment that you're going to have to sell for pennies on the dollar if the business goes broke. So do what you can to steward your money well, be a bit of a miser in the early days. And then I would say what I've told our good buddy Eric is that you are either every day, you are either working a job to get paid in your business, or you are finding jobs to put on the schedule, on the calendar. Finding jobs isn't spending $8,000 $8,000 to wrap your truck in the logos of your business. It's literally, it's Hunter cold calls on Twitter, right? One of our favorite Twitter. It's making the cold calls. It's making the emails. It's sending the text to your current clients about either A, do you have additional work that you need done? Do you have someone that you know that you could put me in contact with that I could do work for? Remember that I do this, this, and this. I specialize in these things outside in the wintertime. I specialize in this sort of stuff. You are either doing work to get paid or you're putting work on the calendar, which is an extremely low capital expense. It's just a fairly high human capital. It takes some time, right? You just got to get in and make the calls and make the emails and make the text and do the thing. I would say in general, you want to stay away from you know paid advertising on social media. It's not time to start making tons of content yet. Like That stuff comes down the road. Right now, it's about using who you know and the network that you currently have to continue to get jobs. To tag on to that, my first piece of content in August of 2014 was a email with BCC to 200 people that says, hey, left my job, starting my own thing. This is what I do. Aggressively looking for new new clients would love, you know, so put something in your church bulletin and put something out to all your friends and family. And then to your point, Get some people, do great work for them, give them a great startup offer, and then say, hey, would love to do more work for you or would love a referral to a friend. That's exactly right. It all comes down to, we've talked a lot about the value equation that, you know, price is what you pay, value is what you get. Your job as a service provider is to provide significantly more value than what the perception is for the client of what they're paying. If they're paying you $500, You're giving them $800 worth of value so that they come back. Your job is to be the best in the world at the thing you do. Even if, and as time comes and you get more and more experience, obviously you have the ability to provide better and better service. You can't buy experience. You can't read enough books to get experience. Experience comes with experience. It takes tens of thousands of hours to get that. But customer service costs nothing. Showing up on time 
costs nothing. I hired an electrician a few months ago that got a sauna and a cold plunge and put them on my back deck and needed like a 220 outlet. Bro. To be, oh, dude, I love it. So fun. Cold plunge coaching yet or no? I'm not going to cold plunge coach. Actually, I've got a, we're doing a guy's night tonight out at the house. Got one of my clients coming in from Wichita. Got a bunch of my guys from church. We're going to hang out. We're all going to do sauna, hot tub, cold plunge, you know, drink some bourbon, have some fun. But anyway, so this guy, here's how I got the electrician. I have a great HVAC guy who's extremely honest, does great work, high integrity. And I texted him. I said, Jesse, my HVAC guy, do you have a really solid electrician that you use? You know, an HVAC guy has to. This is what I need. I need an outlet put in. I've got space on my breaker to do it. He gave me the name again from a network, texted this guy. I said, this is what I need. He said, can I call you in five minutes? He called me in five minutes. He said, can I be there Sunday at 1 p.m.? Sunday at 1 p.m. You have time for a quick five-minute call. I'll be there Sunday. I said, sure. Like, this guy's working on Sunday. He pulls up at 12.58, two minutes early. He's dressed in khaki pants and a polo, right? And this is construction guys. They typically, you know, they look like crap. He shows up on time. He's got his little notepad. He takes notes. He takes pictures. Within an hour, I had a written bid sent to me. He said, if tomorrow morning, Monday morning, you'll call this company where you get the parts, you won't have to pay me the GC 10% extra for me buying the parts. Call and ask for this, this, and this. Pay them over the phone with your credit card. I'll go by and pick them up, and I'll be there Monday morning to do the work. And by noon Monday morning, it was done, and the guy crushed it, right? And so all of that stuff from a customer service standpoint doesn't cost anything. Now, this guy also probably is a highly experienced electrician. That experience is going to take time. What doesn't take time or cost is the customer service side, especially in a post-COVID world where we've seen service just tank. So if you can separate yourself from a service perspective, you can make a big impact. So you're now this guy or lady, whatever you're the business owner, you've found some customers, you're putting some money in the bank, you're only spending money out of that bank account on the business to grow the business, you're either working jobs in that business to make money or you're finding jobs to put on the calendar. So now you're six months, seven months, eight months in. What is the next step from either a bookkeeping perspective or finding the right accountant to take you to the next step to actually start to put these things to have a good handle on things like simple profit and loss financial statements? Again, I think you were talking about unit economics. We've got a podcast on that. It takes, I think it takes a couple years. It certainly takes a year to really have accurate unit economics because there's just too much variability for the first several months on what you spend, what you charge. One thing that's happening, and like if that guy's got a full-time job, this guy, it's funny, I have like the same electrician who does stuff for me and he's got a full-time job and he kind of moonlights nights and weekends. And if he were really growing that thing and he did the same thing, he comes over, he looks at everything, he sends me a clean bid and tells me to buy all the stuff. And if he wants to take a real go at it, he's doing a great job because he's only selling you his time and he's not even selling you his time. He's just saying, this is what it's going to cost. You buy all the parts. I'm going to take no risk. I'm just going to run wires and get a little sweaty and do the work. The thing that happens is that guy runs out of time. That's right. And so then that guy goes, hey, I need to go hire somebody. And that's not true. What that guy needs to do is raise his prices. Mm. And then they raise their prices, raise their prices, raise their prices. And then they go, but I'm still so busy doing my accounting, right? And one day your price becomes higher than what you can pay an accountant to do your accounting. That's right. I mean, you're a smart electrician, so you know something about something, but you're not an accounting expert. So at some point you're going, hey, I'm spending this time and my kind of trade-off of my time is that I could be doing more jobs and now I'm making three fifty an hour just shooting fish in a barrel at Reynolds Cold Plunge. And so like now I need to go hire a bookkeeper and I need to go hire a tax accountant. And to your point, you need tax first. You don't just have the W-2 H&R block, Correct. ship it off, get it done, be done with it. You now have a profit and loss. Like, you don't need to worry about unit economics or P&L because we've put everything in its own bank account. So you know your profit. It's what's left in the bank minus what you shipped out the bank That's right. to your home. <laughs> you know what I mean? Add that back and you get to profit. That's right. 
regardless of what your tax rate is, if you send a dollar home to yourself to go buy something that you want because you've expanded your lifestyle out of your business, even though we told you not to, save 40 cents of every dollar you send home in a separate account. You're going to pay 40% on that. Because you're going to pay taxes. You ain't killed on them. You're going to get killed on them. The second thing is, so at least have those taxes there if you're going to blow all the money because you're going to spend it on stuff that's not a bona fide business expense out there. That's right. There's a lot of ways to find an accountant. You can go back to that same church bulletin you posted on and find Sally from the parish who has a full-time job, who's doing books on the side. You need your profit and loss of your business, which is just a representation of all these bank transactions that are all in this one bank account so that you can hand that off to your tax accountant and they can do this schedule C out there or you know, once you get to, hey, I made a hundred grand top line this year and I'm going to make a hundred grand again top line next year, or I'm going to make 200 or 250, you're getting into, okay, now I need an LLC and I'm going to think about becoming an S Corp and I'm going to do all that. And then you need the next layer of accountant. <laughs> you know, you've hit the next bridge on the toll where you need a small business type accountant. Better bookkeeping is a high-end product, but it is for these business owners, founders out there. And our whole goal was to solve this problem of we want bookkeeping to talk to tax planning, to talk to taxes out there. This isn't a paid ad. But we have other, like, there's something called Collective out there. There's something called Bench. There's all these kind of online services that have been put together out there. So you get to decide, am I going to go to the real world? Am I going to go to my town and find a bookkeeper stay-at-home mom in my town, or am I going to find a middle-range local independent CPA firm that's got a bookkeeper on staff? There's just so many ways to crack this nut, but it becomes more and more expensive the kind of higher echelon you want to go. But sure, you're going to hit the point pretty quick where you have to go solve this problem. But the fact that you built it right, that you put everything in the same container to begin with, makes the problem easier to and solve. And cheaper. The solve. accountant's going to be happy. It's a, <laughs> cheaper to solve. It'll take them less time to actually do the calculations. Now, I was going to say, so for those that don't know, a bookkeeper is a significantly cheaper per hour job than a CPA is. And so what I would suggest is that when it comes time to hire somebody to do your bookkeeping, you don't necessarily, unless you're a big time business, you can hire a bookkeeper often for $30 an hour, $40 an hour, things like that. Whereas a CPA is going to be $150 an hour, $200 an hour, whatever. And so you can pay the bookkeeper to keep the books. And so then everything is nice and clean from the bookkeeper. They can then send the tax accountant clean bookkeeping. It takes the tax accountant, who's more expensive per hour, now significantly less time to do your taxes because everything is clean. And now you get your taxes done for a, a much cheaper rate. And you're paying for their expertise to make sure that you also are taking advantage anywhere you can to get those tax advantages. And then the other piece I would say is this. The first place I would start is most business owners have other friends and people that they respect that are also business owners. Ask them first, hey, do you have a good you know, part-time bookkeeper that you use? Do you have a CPA that you use that you love? And most of them will. And ask five or six or the more you ask, the better options you're going to get. What you'll find in your area is that some of those people are going to be using the same CPA and you'll hear that same name three or four times. And now you've got a good one to use. So rather than just Googling CPAs, instead, go to your close friends that you respect as business owners and ask who they use. And that gives you a good network of someone to reach out to. Dave Ramsey says, find a service provider, whoever it is that has like the heart of a teacher. You need your like Obi-Wan to kind of like pull you through this journey. And it may be the bookkeeper, it may be the CPA, but you need someone who is like your advocate and your teacher and who's going to call you one day and go, Matt, what the hell are you doing, man? Or, you know, like yep. everything's all screwed up and can teach you that lesson that you're about to fly off a cliff or that you might already have and you didn't know it. That's right. The second thing is, to your point, Maybe you do the Masonic Lodge or the Rotary Club or the EO or Vistage or, I mean, this is why these people build Hamptons, a one out there, but people build peer networks who are all growing businesses so that you can have some social proof of, I need a 
HR kind of fractional service. I need a bookkeeper. I need liability insurance. I need all of these things at like, get yourself a squad and grow your squad That's together, right. whether they're in your industry. I mean, I don't know if y'all do that out there, Matt, of like just having a group of these coaches that peer together. It's just, yeah, it's a great idea. A powerful thing. Cause they all hit the same problems at once, you know? That's exactly right. So one of the things I think for us is that we were, when we first launched the online coaching business, it was so different. You know, nobody had liability insurance, but us Lloyd's in London had to write liability insurance for us because yeah. but you can imagine nobody's going to offer liability insurance to online coaches who aren't watching technique and form to make sure that their clients are safe. Yeah. And so while there is tons of cheap liability insurance for in-person coaching, it didn't exist for online coaching until we did it. And the reason we got it is because we actually watched the videos of our clan broke down the technique. And so now that has become like the company that does that, does that for more online coaching companies than just us. You know, as we invented Turnkey Coach, the software platform, we took those best practices and, you know, Stripe, point of sale and, and payment processing and, and things like that. And we put that all as part of the turnkey model for coaches so that they could just do what they do best, which is coach. And so we can handle all that business background stuff for them. And, you know, if somebody bounces a credit card, and there's obviously many reasons that that occurs, it could be insufficient funds, it could be because the card expired, it could be a security issue, whatever, we can handle those things. So we focused as much as we could to try to take that stuff off the plate of the coaches. But I do love the idea, as we move forward of finding good CPAs, obviously, the insurance we've given people access to, good attorneys for this sort of thing, just like you said, because often what we need is the same thing that other coaches in the industry need. And because we have tried to take an attitude of abundance and not scarcity, we're trying to get as many people strong in the world as we can. And that means we don't have to be the ones that coach everyone. That's the other reason we came out with Turnkey Coaches, because we wanted to make sure that other good coaches out there that didn't work for Barbell Logic Online Coaching had access to the best platform and software on the internet to be able to get people strong. That's a great idea. There's this whole community on Twitter called Tax Twitter. They don't like me, but that's okay. I love them. <laughs> There's this guy, Jason Stats, who started this community called Realize, and it's all CPA firm owners in one community. And the same thing, we share software, we share this and that. And I'm in a mastermind with these three dudes, and it's invaluable. I mean, sure. I have the smallest firm of everybody in the group, and these guys are just so smart. So, like, you know, getting hooked into being able to buy from vendors that are all rated by people that you know and respect. So that's how you're going to find a CPA is you're going to go find one of your friends who's in the same business or at least a close enough looking business to you. The best thing you can do with that CPA is just walk in, just say, hey, I want to pay you for two hours. I want to show you everything that I have. And I want you to tell me everything I'm doing wrong or everything I'm doing right or all the ideas. Yes. And they're either going to love that or they're going to just say, I don't know what you're even talking about. And if they don't know what you're even talking about, send you somewhere else. Go to the next guy who understands that idea of just. That's right. That's right. I know money's tight. I know you're starting a business, but this is how you, if you go in and you go, what's your hourly rate? Give me two hours and give me the best of what you got for two hours. That person's going to either love you or tell you, Hey, that's not what we do here. And if they do it and they do it well, the 300 bucks that you're going to spend for the two hours of work, it will pay for itself over and over and over again if they actually do a good job for you because you'll save thousands of dollars out of it. I went and saw, uh, what's his name? Winfrey yeah. in South Houston did a coaching West. This was eight years ago and I learned stuff that day that I never forgot. You still take. Like, yep, yeah. Right. So it's like the same way that you would do an initial assessment. Like there's so much value there. And CPAs don't, uh, it's that thing of like the knowledge gap. Real true professionals don't even know what they know. So it's your job as the business owner to go just like sponge their mind dry and get anything that you can get. That's right. Because they haven't thought about building a program, they haven't thought about doing all this stuff. They're just working, but you can get them to set you up. You can buy their attention. It'll give you a lot of value and it will give you a share of their mind where they will have a context for you forever because they set you up. You yeah, know? exactly. 
Yep. That's a recommendation. That's cool. Uh, by the way, Randy Winfrey. Randy. Yeah, yeah, Randy. And we call him the most trustworthy man. If you look at his bio picture, he's the guy looks like he, he's just like the most trustworthy. Like you would trust this guy to be president of the United States. So he's got a great, great guy. Let's wrap this up. So first off, as we said, put a cap on this. If you are a young startup business owner in the fitness industry or whatever, the best thing to do is open that bank account. It doesn't even have to be a business bank account. Spend all the money out of that account for the business. Make sure all of the revenue for that new business goes into that account so that everything is siloed and go get customers first. Go get customers. And then a few months down the road, once you have some customers, once you have some money coming in, then the next step is to start looking for the bookkeeper and the tax CPA. Ask your yep. other business owner friends that you trust who they use, get some good references. By the way, the other nice thing about that is when you have that connection, you'll often get treated better by the professional. Again, it comes back to the Kiesling thing. I didn't know who David Kiesling was. And then because Scott knew me and was my friend and connected me to Kiesling, then Kiesling became my attorney. And I had a good relationship with Kiesling from the very beginning. I got his cell phone number. I texted him. I could call him. He would text me. So you're not just a number to that professional service. You know, this is Scott Hambrick's friend, or this is so-and-so's friend. And so that's another great way to start. And so for people who are looking for, tell us a little bit about how people find you and better book. By the way, you have a massive following on Twitter. How many followers do you have on Twitter? Like 80,000 or something? 80 something thousand. That's crazy, yeah, man. that's been a wild ride. So yeah, I started tweeting in the pandemic and, and just, I was like the only accountant who was talking about accounting stuff. So and follow me on Twitter at Baldridge CPA. Okay. At Baldridge CPA. Perfect. And I have this like pin tweet that's just a thread of threads that's kind of a lot of the corpus of a lot of my thoughts. And I have this kind of page I've developed called the How to Work With Me. But like, you know, I kind of have a small business for having a big firm. I don't sell courses. You can read everything I've written. You can listen to my podcast. We have this service called Better Bookkeeping. It's for business owners and founders who have, you know, small kind of service businesses that this kind of Starting price is $1,000 a month, and that's all the bookkeeping, all the tax planning, and the tax preparation, just your whole kind of business in a box. And we come off of that a little bit or we go up. But when you get a full suite of clients and you're humming along, it's a great service. We've been fortunate to kind of build something exactly like what I wanted, <laughs> you know? So Excellent. Yeah. And then you've done a great job, I think, with a similar strategy as what we've used at Barbell Logic, where you make your money off service, yep. but you've put out a ton of excellent free content on the Stupid Tax podcast with Scott. It's a great, you guys do a great job combo. The Stupid Tax podcast is the Barbell Logic podcast, by the way. We just copied it. So. Yeah, for accounting. And it works great. And you're, you know, you're the subject matter expert. Scott is the color man and, you know, provides the comedy relief. We're like the two guys who like dated the same girl and we're like meeting now. So. <laughs> I love it. It's perfect. Yeah. Dating Scott Hambrick is what we did. So, hey, man, thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate it. We'll have you guys on more. Would love to probably have you and Scott on together at some point. The three of us, the world might explode at some point, but that would be fun, especially if we are able to do that in person at some point. It'd be a real blast. So, Thank you for being on the show. Again, if you guys have gotten value from this, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast. Check out Baldridge CPA on Twitter. It's a great follow, as well as a lot of the tweets that you repost, like some of our other favorite accounts, like Hunter Cold Calls, is if you're not following, some of those are fantastic. And so you also interact with a lot of great people on Twitter, and you can find some great connections there as well. So Hey, man, thanks again for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is fun. I appreciate it. Awesome. You guys have a great weekend, and we'll see you next Friday. Bye.